Hello, thank you. Welcome. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. Um, I'll just get through the pre nerves Hopefully, um, hopefully I can um, connect with you, and this is going to be like an enjoyable presentation. I've put together a PowerPoint, which I haven't done for a long time. I've struggled doing it. I don't want it to become death by PowerPoint. I'm aware of that as a phrase. Um, so if at any point it feels like that, just give me a nudge and we can, I can adapt and <laughs> move into other things. Um, I've brought some practical demonstrations along with me. So I've got some food that we can have a, a play with. We can have a taste and do some testing. Um, but before I get to that, I'll just give you a little bit of background from where I'm coming from. Um, so that is, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade, a uh, sort of practical person uses their hands. Um, then I went off, peeled off and did a, an environmental degree. So I got really interested in ecology and then deep ecology. So I now sort of call myself a, a deep ecologist. And the, um, well, you've has anybody heard of deep ecology? Is, am, I, am I talking to a room of people that... <laughs> that's lovely. Um, so essentially, for me, deep ecology is about questioning our current worldview. And it suggests that our current worldview, which dominates today, is a view where we have separated ourselves from nature. So we stand outside of nature. And because of that separation, we try and control nature. And I'm su uh, deep ecology suggests it's that philosophy that is actually destroying the planet as we, as, we, as we see it at the moment. So deep ecology is about articu uh, articulating an alternative worldview, questioning our current one and bringing in an alternative worldview, one where we truly are connected with nature, we're a part of nature, we're part of the whole thing. Um, that's quite complex. But I believe that in the pursuit of growing food for nutrition, we may begin to uncover what that actually means. Um, so I did my environmental degree, I did a, uh, I I did a year in, in working for nine months in, in um, the Somerset Wildlife Trust, working in woodlands, working in grasslands, I did three months in the rainforest working out there in the Amazon as a guide and a resident naturalist, as a grounding to get used to ecology, to feel ecology. And, um, and then on the back of that, I came back and ran a gardening charity for 11 years called the Good Gardeners Association. That was set up in 1966, just after HDRA. And it was, um, they promoted no-dig organic gardening. That was their bag. It was a no-dig gardening charity. In fact, here's um, one of the books that we used to uh, give to new members that was written sort of 1949 or something, um, Gardening Without Digging, three shillings. You know, it's, the concept's been around for quite a while, um, and there's a real movement today where, where no digging is suddenly, and no till in farming is suddenly all the rage. It seems to me that it often begins in the gardening world and then moves out to tell the farmers how to, how to farm. Um, but that was my experience, 11 years working as, with a charity, and I was developing the idea of growing food for nutrition then, and I did an eight-year research project with the Biodynamic Association looking at the effect of tillage on the transfer of nutrients from soil to plant. And I was looking at it in many different ways. Um, and I was also trying to develop education projects as well, going into schools, getting children to grow food, and try and understand is there any difference between how you grow the food and the quality of the food that comes out, as in the nutrition. So I was doing all that for 11 years, ran out of money, had to go back to work. I've been a cider maker, craft cider maker for five years, followed by I'm now doing carpentry. But last year I found out that in America, this organisation called the Bionutrient Food Association had developed what they are calling a bionutrient scanner um, that would test fruits and vegetables for its nutritional density. And it's something, it's an idea that I had about 15 years ago. And when I heard about it, I instantly connected and thought, ah, here's, a, here's the device that I tried to invent but couldn't, is now, is suddenly now out there and appeared. So I went to America and I attended their conference and I've now got hold of a scanner. I believe it's possibly the only one in this country. And they're running a citizen science project to get people to contribute samples of 
fruits and vegetables and the soils they were grown in so that they can have them laboratory tested to analyse the mineral content, the proteins, um, antioxidants and polyphenols, as well as analysing the soil samples for organic matter, carbon and soil life. Along with that, there's scanning. I'll get the, the device out. Um, this is the device that they've created. Um, it's uh, based on mass spectrometry. It's ma ugh, mass spectrometry. I can't say that right. It's mass spectrometer. Um, shrunk into a handheld device. Um, so it's a flash of light and it reflects back the light and records the reflectance. So it's light reflectance. And it's a way of potentially assessing the density of nutrients in the food. I'll come back to this to explain that a little more, but this is the, essentially why I'm here today, is to talk about developing this bit of technology and whether there's any way of collaborating um, in research, because with the Citizen Science Project, we're creating a lot of data, and it's open source data, um, and, and anybody is welcome to use that data and so if there are projects that would be of interest that you can connect with, then maybe there's a way of collaborating around that. Um, so now I just want to come back a, a step or two. Um, so having found out about the scanner, I now have one. I want to now push the idea of Growing Food for Nutrition, and I want to set up a community interest company called Growing Food for Nutrition to help develop this scanner. So that's now where I'm coming from. Um, so I'm going to go to the first slide. I'm going to touch the screen and apparently it's going to move. Um, it's not going to move. It's just got bigger. You might be better off. Shall I do the, the pointy bit? Yeah. The, 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 the picture there is, is a symbolic picture. We can, we'll keep coming back to that, by the way. Um, it's, it's, for me, it's, it's about our understanding of nutrition dictates the quality of our environment. So the way we currently think about food and nutrition is, I think, dominated by um, economics. And the accountant rules the bottom line. And food has become so cheap that we can't afford to make good food anymore. And as a result, um, there seems to be an issue going on with soil fertility. And with, the issue, with that issue, the nutrients aren't coming up into the plant, but the pound notes are. But what's going on in the background is the amount of pollution that we're creating, um, the amount of degenerative disease and need for hospitals that we're creating, um, the use of fossil fuels in the, in the growing of cheap food. Um, it's all linked to what I think is a poor understanding of nutrition. And where we want to get to is more over to this side. Um, so that's about understanding what nutrition is. In fact, before I go to the next slide, um, can I just get a general consensus about your understanding of nutrition? This is kind of hard, but I've been going out doing research with growers, and I say at the end of it, so what is nutrition? And it's an open question. So has anybody got, can anybody give me a a short answer of what nutrition is. Put you on the spot. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> well, I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, this is Elsie Widdowson. I expect there's a name you've probably heard of before. Um, so she created the, the um, um, she was part cr creator of the food composition tables. Uh, she advised government on the wartime rations based on nutritional advice. And I heard her being interviewed on Woman's Hour by Jenny Murray once. And, um, and, I, and I extracted this quote from that interview. And this was her understanding of, um, of nutrition, and where it is today, or where it was in, in the 90s when this interview happened. I don't need to read that, as you've probably all read it by now. Is, is there a general nod? Do you think that's a, it, do you think that's a, 
do, do, do you kind of connect with that statement or uh, do you think it's true? Do you think it's not true? Um, I mean, I, 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 I get the sense that at core you're a deep thinking bunch of, <laughs> bunch of people and I'd like to think that you've, you've gone beyond um, what a typical scientist thinks of nutrition. I've seen a few nodding heads. I hope that's general consensus. Um, Not necessarily the case anymore, but career scientists don't do... I mean, I think that's shifted in itself. Yeah. It's interesting how it is shifting now, isn't it? I, I feel. But... Um, um, so my next slide is, is, what is nutrition? I mean, is it... Is it um, printed on the, the label, uh, printed on a piece of plastic packaging that the food comes in, which means that it, the, the nutrition has been predetermined before it's even got into the packet? Or is it a living ecosystem involving the roots and the billions of microorganisms just surrounding that one plant? And that plant may appear um, in a different geographical location, in a different soil, and a different climate. So each plant is probably unique in its nutritional composition based on where it's grown, who's grown it, and what's surrounding the roots. So actually, one carrot is, is an individual, just perhaps as, as, you know, as, as humans are individuals. Um, if you looked and analysed all the nutrients within that one carrot, you couldn't, you couldn't find two that would actually be the same. So, the UN are about to start their conference on nutrition next week. It just flew into my inbox yesterday. Their 46th um, consecutive conference on nutrition. And for me, that picture says a lot. Uh, their statements are, are very bold. Um, I wonder how many of the pe these people actually have their hands in the soil and connect with plants. They are creating policies about what they think nutrition is. And underlying all that is now going to be some of the big businesses, the biofortification and the genetically um, developed plants, which, you know, they've identified, was it, vitamin C, iron and zinc, I think, as three major deficiencies in the diet. And so what, our, what their response is, is to fortify the foods with those nutrients. That means that they're ignoring the value of the soil because I think the reason why these nutrients are missing is because the quality of the soil and the life within the soil is depleted. So instead of thinking about the cause, they're trying to treat the symptom. Fred, and I'll tell you about Fred later on because I've got some of his carrots. <laughs> he grows exceptionally good food and when I've been around just doing some initial testing, just to try and get a little bit of a feel for a baseline, um, it turns out that some of his food was the best that I tested. And when you taste it, and you compare it to another, you know, one, his carrot compared to another carrot, you might actually feel yourself what the difference is, as well as me showing that there might even be a difference when you measure it. So, who do you put your trust in to create nutritious food? I mean, this, I have to say, pays the wages and the mortgage and, and the holidays. And this guy is struggling his nuts off, but he's saving the planet. Who do we support here? This is the deep ecology thing of this is coming out of separation from nature. We're separating from nature. And this is where we need to go to. We need to reconnect and become part of nature. So our nutrition is involved in this whole process of supporting this guy who's a brilliant, brilliant grower of food. The trees along the line there as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's developing the, the, the model of agroforestry. So it's the diversity that's moving in. So 
This is what dominates our nutrition at the moment. This is what dominates our understanding. So based on that, how well have we been doing? So, I, I, I mean, I sat there over the last couple of days thinking, oh, I've got to put figures to all this. But you don't need to put figures to all this now, do we? Because we know what's going on. Um, soil health, we know what's going on. A loss of fertility in, what, 50 years? We can argue about how many years. What is fertility? What is soil fertility? It seems that there's a lot of confusion around what soil fertility is. Um, but the idea that we cannot grow, we will not be able to grow food in 40, 50, 60 years' time, it's a bit of a wake-up call. And it, to me, suggests that this worldview that is dominant today has created this problem of the loss of soil fertility. So climate, what's going on with the climate right now? You know, we don't, I don't need to put any figures to this now. We know what's going on. Loss of nutrients. Well, some really good studies, going back to McCants and Widowson, the composition of chemical food tables. We can go back to the 1940s and look at the value of food and how it's been depleted over the time. Biodiversity. We don't need to put any figures to that now. We know, we can feel what's going on. We can see with our own eyes, we can hear, we can... The, the amount of birds, the amount of insects that we're, in, you know, that we're interacting with. Malnutrition. You know, we're in a country where we have an abundance of food and malnutrition in this country is on the rise. And degenerative disease. It's, <laughs> you know, in this country where we have access to lots of nutrition, degenerative disease is on the rise. And under, underlying all of this, of course, is population increase. So with every extra mouth on the planet, we are destroying um, and contributing to all these issues. And this has been going on for a long time. For me, it goes back to at least the 1700s and the period of enlightenment. And I expect it goes way back before then as well. But that's when it was identified when we separated from nature. We made a conscious decision not to trust the natural, um, the, the kind of spiritual values that exist in nature. And we created a way and a methodology of testing the physical phenomena only. And it, we've perpetuated that cycle to where we are today. And where we are today, when you look at it, it's not very healthy. So, are we going to wake up? Are we going to insist? I couldn't resist putting this picture. <laughs> you know, whilst we, whilst we think we understand what nutrition is today, the planet is burning. You know, there's a feedback system going on. And, um, and so it kind of suggests that we need to be looking in other areas uh, to, to, uh, to find solutions. And, um, <laughs> oh, I've lost my order there. Um, so that was my little statement of um, the way that we think about just nutrition is actually destroying ecosystems. And you can actually measure that by the poor nutritional quality of the food that we produce today. We've lost our symbiotic connection between us and the life in the soil. So... What I'm seeing in the tools that I've brought today are tools for uh, changing that, or at least stepping into that arena and working out how we can create a more harm harmonious ecosystem to grow food. Um, to do that may require a reconfiguration. <laughs> and I think it's called um, the idea of a, you know, a paradigm shift. It's actually changing our reality and the way that we connect with the world. So this is pretty deep stuff. And I did say that I was a deep ecologist and <laughs> I'm, express, I'm expressing this kind of, you know, uh, this, is a, this is a new thing for me to actually express it to you today. I hope it's coming across and making a bit of sense. But I was, when I, went, I would come back to doing my environmental degree, I was always struck by this quote by Jonathan Porritt. Um, you know, environmental crisis, no, there is no environmental crisis. It's just a crisis of the mind. It's just the way that we think. And we think we're separate from nature. We need to work out, work out how to think 
like being a part of nature. And Masanobu Fukuko, oh, I can't say that last word very well. Um, if you come across him, One Straw Revolution, um, I know, it's another quote that's always stuck with me. But, um, you know, agriculture is not about food. It's about, it's about understanding our relationship with nature. So if we go into looking at nutrition and how nutrition is created, it's a, it's a tool for change. We, you know, I think if we start to in, step into that arena, we can understand nutrition at a deeper level. For me, this is nutrition. It comes from nutritional medicine um, definition. And it, it, it's this bit here, it's the sum of the processes. So nutrition is the sum of the processes involved in taking in nutrients, assimilating and utilising them. So when you think about the sum of the processes, for me that goes straight back to the soil. Because we're looking at a billion, 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 billion organisms working with just one carrot. And that's a lot of processes. And you have to make sure that that beginning process um, is there in the first place. And that means making sure that you've got healthy soil. And so to make healthy soil, you have to be aware of what it is you're trying to achieve. So you're already getting humans to get connect with the soil and the organisms <coughs> in the soil. Um, we're talking about what are nutrients here. Um, so we've got the obvious ones. <coughs> That runs our, our physical body, the carbs and the, the minerals and the vitamins. That's great. But there's also um, you know, this idea of, of uh, here we go at the bottom, nutrients such as love. You know, is love a nutrient? My wife works in a, an offend, in, a, in, a, in a prison with young offenders. Her story is every one of those was there because they hadn't been loved as a child. Elsie Widdowson, going back to her, when she, uh, after the Second World War, she went out to do a study in Germany in an orphanage where um, one group of orphans were being fed one diet and another group of orphan orphans another diet. One was worked out to be nutritionally complete and the other wasn't. And they noticed a difference in the growth of those children. And then at some point, the matrons were switched. So the, the group that were on the, on the not so very healthy diet with that matron weren't growing properly. They switched the matron and it turned out the group being fed the nutritionally complete diet now had this matron who was nothing short of an ogre. She gave them no love whatsoever. And these children stopped developing in, in, in a normal way. And I've probably explained that a little bit badly, but it's a concept there, which Elsie Widdowson described as the nutrient of love. And so she, she's, th that, that, you know, that is research which we can go back and find. Um, so it's important to include emotion and feeling as part of nutrition. So... I want to now focus on um, the idea that one plant is one ecosystem and that we can measure the health of an ecosystem one at a time. And so what we're doing is we're studying the flow and transfer of energy and matter through a community of organisms. So our community are bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, arthropods, worms, there are a billion, 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 billion organisms there. That's enough for me to make up a community of organisms. And, um, and so what, what we can do is we can measure the transfer of matter from soil to the carrot. So we're measuring one ecosystem. And if that's... Well, I'm going to push on to the next slide and leave you with that whilst I set up now. Um, I want to, to, to get some carrots going and start squishing it. I think I've done enough talking and I don't want people to go to sleep. So, so I've brought with me um, some organic carrots from, uh, these are from Lidl, so it's Oakland's. And, um, and some carrots from Fred's um, place. So... Has anybody ever used or tested food using a refractometer? 
Um, it's pretty simple. This is the refract, which you probably are familiar with. Um, let me organise. So I ought to actually just push on to the next slide because this, this um, is a BRICS chart which was developed back in the 70s by Dr. Kerry Reams. So he came up with this chart. Um, he used to run a big, a big lab and he noticed, he noticed that um, there seemed to be a correlation between mineral content and, and uh, sweetness and BRICS. So he created this table and for each specific fruit and vegetable um, gave it a value to the categories of poor, average, good and excellent. So what I've been doing just this last month or so is going around the country to growers and to retail units um, and just asking them if I can test their veg because I hadn't done this before. Um, So all we need to do is cut a slice of carrot to extract a bit of juice in these lovely homemade uh, pliers that I've had made up. Um, oh, I'll tell you what, I won't use that one. There we go. So it's just two or three drops of juice required. Pop the lid down. Hold that up to the light. Just needs a bit of focus. And then I'm going to pass that round. So um, you can then take a reading on the brick scale to the left. Um, so tell me what it says. Francis, did you? I, I, I didn't notice the number. You didn't notice the number. All right. Yes, where the, where the blue meets the white. Um, so I read it quickly as, as nine. If you care for a piece of carrot, just taste it. This is, this is Fred. I'm going to make a lovely mess up here with the carrot squishing. We do. I'm not even going to disguise the fact, I'm not, I'm not even going to do any blind taste testing or anything like that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be quite open about this. Yeah, it's, um, that needs a bit more of a, of a setup to do that. So, any thoughts on um, on the carrot? What? Yeah. What? What I've coming to because um, I've been going around the country is great. I'm getting to taste all these different carrots from Wales, from Somerset, from Gloucester, Bristol, and I'm coming up with um, it's either watery, sweet, full of flavour, and aftertaste. Those are the sort of four parameters I'm coming up with to assess the taste. And I think that that if you rated those four things on a one scale of one to five, that would probably get you pretty near to describing what it is you're tasting. Uh, sorry? Um, I don't know what the varieties are, and yes, that is obviously, potentially, that's a, um, that could alter things. Um, but I don't want to get too wrapped up in the variety. That suddenly opens out a whole another lot of variables. And on this chart, um, the carrots uh, is just, you know, is not identified as different varieties. 
I mean, if you put all the varieties of carrot, you'd suddenly expand this list down here and then all the varieties of cauliflowers and cabbages. You know, it would just get too much. We just need to be in the ballpark here. Yeah. Starts off from a stronger position. Yeah. And therefore, one would want to make it that, but still grow in different conditions. Yeah. That's, yeah. So, so this carrot was picked yesterday, I believe. Um, these, I don't know when they were picked. So, um, yeah, all I know is a, a best by date. But if we are looking to maximise nutrition, then that potentially becomes um, a thing. If you want to maximise nutrition, you need something that comes straight out of the ground, not delivered not picked and delivered, you know, two weeks after. Because that requires a lorry to load it and storage to store it, you know, which is all producing carbon, which is um, changing the climate, which is, you know, depending how it's grown, altering the quality of water courses and so forth and so forth. Right. Yeah, it's 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 yeah um it, yeah actually I'm not I'm not totally uh, I'm not seeing it. I don't think I've got enough. Well, to be fair, this one doesn't look as bad as I... Th um, it, it's about an eight, but let's taste it. It actually is actually reading quite similar to the other one, yeah. but I am, and 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 the taste um, yeah. I'm picking up, it's not a bad taste, I know. <laughs> you know, it's it's yeah. Oh damn! When an experiment doesn't work as you were hoping it was going to, but that's okay, isn't it? So did you say that was an organic carrot? As well? That was an organic carrot. Yeah, yeah. This is they're both organic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, So, okay. I mean, I, I just tasted the two now. If you are you picking up any difference in the taste? I mean, would you have you got a memory of the one that you tasted? To the the first one was sweeter. Yeah. 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 Maybe. Yeah. I certainly noticed that when I squashed and the juice came out. The, the first one seemed to be more viscous and more solid in colour, and the other one was, was it looked thinner, and more watery. But to be fair, it had a, yeah, it had a reasonably good um, rating. However, I mean, 
we're looking at nine, we're looking at falling into the average category, both of those carrots. And both of these carrots, I mean, this one, which is from Fred, does actually have um, some damage to the carrot, a bit of disease. I don't know if that's root fly starting to come in. And the organic carrot from, from Lidl has got bruising. And, you know, it's, they're not perfect specimens of carrots by any, any means. And, and interestingly, what is... What Reams is saying when he produced this chart and what people have been working on is that actually when it's in the excellent category, there are some plants that are resistant, completely resistant to pest and disease. So we've just tested the carrots, they are an average. So, and there's a little bit of disease in both of these carrots. They're still pretty good, probably good, as good as what we're used to. But the potential is for that to be a lot more nutritious, a lot tastier, and abs completely absent of pest and disease. That's potentially where we're going to in trying to improve the nutrition of that. Um, I would like to do just one more uh, with tomatoes to see if we can actually pick up a, a difference in the bricks stroke taste. I'm going to make a bit of a mess now with the tomatoes, I think. I'll <laughs> do that on the cloth. Sorry? I'm sure we can clean this up later. Yeah. Um, right, where did the refract go? Ah, lovely. Thank you. So with the tomato juice, I've just got a couple of pips that I'm moving out of the way. Right, so that's, that's about a five. I'm telling you that's about a five. So when you look through the, the window, um, you look at where the blue meets the white, and that's where you read the scale. Um, yes, this is organic tomatoes um, that I'm cutting now. They're from Spain. And that was a, what was that, a five? So if you look at the scale, we're on five here. Hopefully that's enough. And tomatoes are... You've got a four, have you? Yeah, okay. Well, they're, 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 they're quite poor. Uh, if it was reading six, it would be in the average category. So those are from um, the co-op. They're organic, organic tomatoes from the co-op. Yeah. Um, so these are Fred's um, organic tomatoes. Yeah. They'll have been picked a long time ago. I know. I know. Thanks. But what that's showing, of course, is, the ver is that there's variation and that it can be affected by when it was picked. And if you were trying to maximise the nutrition potential, you might want to consider having something that was freshly picked, not picked a long time ago. It's just raising questions, really, about how we should um, the access the food. 
Absolutely, yeah. Right, hopefully that's enough samples. Hmm. Right. Nobody's going to need lunch now, are they? That's a Yeah, these are Fred's. <coughs> ah. Right. What's the taste? Have you tasted the difference now? With you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't always take. No, it doesn't stack up. I I was testing some strawberries that were said to be super super sweet, and when I tested them, you know they they appeared sweet, but actually when I tested them for the bricks, which is measuring sugar content, um, they were really low. When I put them onto the chart, it was like, oh, that's that's interesting. So there's some trickery going on, or there's something going on that's that's making it appear sweet when it's not actually sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, have you had a taste on Fred's tomato then? It's, uh, are, you, are, you, are you sensing a difference between the tomatoes? Oh, did you get a piece, did you? Yes, I Yeah, did. okay. <laughs> 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 so I think what, what th this has possibly worked a little bit better than the carrot in that we've just found a variation in the bricks so one was four stroke five this one of Fred's was about eight um, <coughs> eight is moving it towards the good category um, so we're measuring a difference with the bricks and we're also beginning to taste a difference with our senses so, um, so that's I, you know I, I'm finding that. Oh, sorry, did it? Oh, yeah, right. Um, I'm finding that intriguing. The fact that there are differences and we can taste it. Um, so, I've spent the last month or so going around the country, getting samples of food and doing a lot of bricks testing, just to try and establish a bit of a baseline. So I've gone to growers and I've gone to retail outlets. Um, the last one I managed to get was the co-op. So they actually, I sent a letter in and said, can I test your, 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 your fruit and veg for nutrition? And, and the store manager went, whoa, wait a minute. And then it, it, my letter went right up the chain to the group manager because I had to go to that level before they could say, OK. Um, so he said, yeah, OK. So I was able to get a picture of him with the basket of food. You know, it was a bit of a coup. Um, so as a local fruit and veg shop, um, Terry Walton, he's our Radio 2 allotment here. So I made contact with him, I've been to his. Charles Dowding, Mr No Dig, you know, plus a few others. Um, and so these are the results that I've got. Now I'm testing these vegetables and fruits because that's the ones they're currently testing in America, where they've already started with the, the nutrient scanner. Um, so this is the bricks reading. So pretty much all the carrots were falling into the average category apart from one. That got a 12. So actually that was Fred's. And this, eight, this carrot that we measured of his was only eight. The one I had the other week was actually better than this one. Something's, something's happened there. Yeah, I only did, I on, yeah, I didn't do multiples to take an average. No, I literally, I said, I'm, I'm not, I'm just going for a, a, a rough and ready assessment. I haven't got the, the funding and the resources and the time to go any further. And yes, you could criticise, I guess, is that what you're pointing at? It's the number of... 
Yeah, and it may well be. Absolutely, absolutely, and and I totally agree, and that may be the case. Um, but then I'm also saying that one carrot is one ecosystem. You know, so one carrot growing next to another carrot might turn out to be different anyway. But that's okay if it's come out of a healthy ecosystem. So moving along, the leaves just all seem to be really low. So the spinach was low, the lettuces were low, including Charles Dowding's, who's, you know, that's, his, his, that's what he does. Um, and then it comes to the kale. Sorry, what was that? I was thinking, it yeah. doesn't matter the sugar content of the spinach or yeah. No, no. But it's, it's um, <coughs> I'll go back to Carry Reams. What he's saying is from his, when he had his laboratory and he created this, it was based on his observation that high mineral content related to high sugar content as well. And so the number, the BRICS number, relates to each specific uh, vegetable and fruit type. Um, <coughs> but anyway, come to kale. Um, and everything was dropping into the poor category apart from these two. Um, so the market garden, this was Fred's, and that was, you know, practice, I'm calling it agroforestry. He also practices it to the Maria Toon planting calendar, so it's part biodynamic. Um, he doesn't use the preps, but he does plant according to the calendar. Um, the other one, the other one was the retail was uh, was actually a, a, a farm shop, uh, locally grown. Um, I've got a bit of kale. If anybody wants, this is some of Fred's kale. If anybody wants, I'm not going to squash it. It's very easy to squash, but if anybody wants to take a piece, uh, it's perfectly edible. Um, and what it does for me is it enlivens my mouth. I think. I'm sort of thinking, oh, I might be eating something that's really nutritious here. And that means it's been grown in a pretty healthy ecosystem with lots and lots of microbes. And as you know, we have a lot of microbes in our gut bacteria as part of that absorbing and utilising the nutrients that are in that food. And the enlivenment that I get in my mouth, it almost feels like the microbes are sort of having a party going, yes, <laughs> yeah. My taste buds are sort of pinging. Hmm? This one, uh, it's the same, um, same source, yeah. I don't want to crush it, but. Um, so for me, this is showing variation. This is showing variation and it's indicating um, that a lot of things are in the poor and average end. A few are in the good and only one or two are in the excellent. I've found some grapes in the excellent. And uh, these ones here, um, the 23, oh, they came from the, the oh, I think they came from, oh, I can't remember where they came from now, but I remember the taste of them. They were completely excellent. I mean, they did just knock your socks off, actually. Uh, just looking at the time. So, I've, I pulled this out, which is that experiment that NASA did with spider webs to bring around the concept of an ecosystem surrounding that one carrot. Um, so this was um, the effect of um, the web of a spider under various chemicals. I think this one was um, amphetamine, sleeping tablet and caffeine. So this was the effect of the spider web that NASA, you know, after, NASA, after they were given, induced by these, um, by these chemicals. And just like the BRICS table, <laughs> just like the BRICS table, we've got, I've put poor, average, good, excellence. So if we can think of this as an ecosystem surrounding that carrot, when the BRICS is low, it could be that our ecosystem is disconnected. It looks like this. So all those billions of organisms that should be there aren't there and they can't make the connections they need to to flow the transfer of matter and energy into the carrot. Whereas we run along the scale to this is the potential of a harmonious ecosystem that's full of nutrients, that's surrounded by so many microbes in such diversity that the plant is able to communicate properly with the, the microbes in the soil and access the nutrients that it requires. So I'm bringing that around as a concept to represent a healthy ecosystem in relation to the BRICS table and 
from field observation, when you get towards this, it gives bigger yields, better tasting food, complete disease resistance in some cases, which means there's still more work to do. And another interesting one is the food doesn't rot, it just dehydrates. So that's back to Fred. There's his setup. We've already kind of had that picture. Um, so I'm championing him. This, um, I've put this in. I don't need to explain this other than this bit. Um, John Kemp runs Advancing Eco Agriculture. Have you come across this organisation in the States? He, um, he's a minefield, a source of information, and is out there growing really healthy, nutritious plants. And he's saying now, you know, under his research and his, his um, the amount of acreage that he's got under his um, guidance, and he's now saying healthy plants become completely resistant to disease and insects. He's seeing that all the time now. And it starts with balancing the chemistry in the soil, because there might be things that are missing, like cobalt, molybdenum, um, which means that plants can't make the compounds that they need to make in order to become healthy and resistant to the disease. So it needs a balance of soil chemistry and you need to ensure that you've got the microbes there in the diversity and numbers that is required to make that healthy ecosystem. So a healthy, nutritious plant is resistant to disease. It's by measuring the nutrition, by making it high, you know that the soil is going to be healthy because it's the only way you can produce something that's highly nutritious. So you're making the planet healthy by empowering, you know, by, by choosing something that's nutritious. And then we benefit from nutrition in better health. So by measuring the food for nutrition, if you get the right definition, you are creating an abundance of health and you're connecting with nature to make that happen. Um, so this is what um, we're into now. It's moving on from the brick scale. It's the bionutrient scanner. Um, so I can show you it again. I've only just recently turned it on. I've now had an app created from the, my, for my testing. So it's all open source. Um, and when I turn it on, I run the app on my phone. I can record the data. I can record where it's from, how it was grown, whatever, you know, whatever data I need to do, we can create the survey form. Um, the way it's working with the Citizen Science Project in America is the samples are coming in, they're being tested in the laboratory so that we know what's actually in it. And then um, it's being scanned at the same time. So that over time, as you build up the samples, the database of known nutrients you can associate to the result of the scanner, we will then be able to switch that around and calibrate the scanner to high nutrient density, low nutrient density. And then this becomes a tool for growers and consumers to use to verify for themselves whether the food's nutritious or not, or for the grower whether what they are doing in their methods, is it working or not? Because each year they've got a measure of success that actually means something. It's about increasing nutrition. So that's the potential of this machine. This is the output. So it's light reflectance. Um, is working between, well, about 300 and 900 um, NMs. I forget what this is. Um, um, and so all this data is being collected. And I can give you the website and you can even access this data right now because it's open source data. Because this is, a t this is you know, they're building this around transparency. This is a tool for, for change. This is, you know, systemic change is what the, the aim of this is. They're doing it in America and I want to set it up in this country so that we can um, do a similar project here. I've, um, no, but I am, I, I, I've only just learned how to use it just this week. Um, I've had it set up, so I did that scan and took that picture. I'm at the Soil Association Organic Matters Conference next week, or the week after, and I'm inviting delegates to bring their samples, and I will 
BRICS test it and scan it at the same time. And then a couple of days after, I'm at the biodynamic conference and I've asked for the same thing so people can bring their food along. So I'm just starting to explore and starting to scan. But ultimately, um, uh, ultimately I, want to, yeah, I want to do this on a larger scale and it needs to be properly funded. I could. Yeah. That, in fact, that was... Mm, no, that wasn't... That wasn't... Uh, possibly, but that might take a bit of... I'm not up to speed enough with doing it, but yes, that would be really interesting, wouldn't it? We've just tasted it. We'd like to now look at the difference in the um, results. Yes. Yeah. Um, you've, you, you, you can now challenge me, and I can now work around that and come back to you, possibly, with, with that data. Yes. Yes. So, so these are the results of the first year of testing, 2018, of carrots and spinach. So, from um, the spinach collected, 108 samples. These are polyphenols and antioxidants. So, the worst and the best spinach that they tested, um, there were 75 times more polyphenols than the worst one. Um, antioxidants, similar story. Yeah, uh, 100 more to 100 times more antioxidants in the best one compared to the worst one. So what I'm sort of seeing here is damaged ecosystem, uh, healthy ecosystem. Yeah. Um, so s same story with, uh, with carrots, antioxidants, polyphenols, but even, you know, tremendous differences are being exposed here. Yes, so the soils are being tested for um, carbon, organic matter and um, soil life. That's what's being tested at the moment. Um, if there was anything in addition to that that you wanted tested, you could. This, you know, this is a dumb machine. It's only going to be as good as you feed the data sets to. So what organisation is doing this? It's called the... Um, it's called the... Bionutrient um, Association, and they've brought together a um, a partner a partnership um, with a company called Our Sci, which is an open source technology development group, and there's another group as well called Next Seven, which is about communication, and they've launched something called the Real Food Campaign. So they've now set that up and they're running with the, the scanner and starting to collect data and it's opened out to anybody to join them. So I would love to get something going in the UK and join them and contribute data from the UK to the project going on in, in America so that you know, we're, we're pulling data in from, from different areas, different soils, different, you know, um, but anyway, th there's their. Um, if you just look up Bionutrient Association, you'll 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 get to their website, and, and you can you can merrily jump around in there. Um, so, iron, magnesium, potassium, calcium. You know, all these are, are being recorded, and it's all data that you can now access. Um, so you can see the potential for data gathering is, is quite large here. And I'm sure that there's a lot of potential for research in there. Plus, you can see what it's capable of. You can add to it if you wanted to. Uh, so here's my summary then, because we're five minutes past. But um, So growing food for nutrition, at the moment, is just my idea. Uh, I'm working with a colleague, Elizabeth Westaway, who's a public health nutritional specialist. Um, we want to set up a community interest company and um, launch a citizen science project. I'm talking with a lab in Andover called Soil Bio Lab, and they're measuring, they're doing the Elaine Ingham testing, so it might be quite a good match to, do, to, to work with them. Um, because I need a lab that would be able to analyse 800 samples of vegetables and soils um, and scan it at the same time and upload it to the, to the database. 
That needs to be paid for. And I'm sort of half wondering whether that would be like a crowdfunding thing. So if, you, if anybody wants to participate, you would you know, pay for your own testing. I don't know how that quite works yet. Um, so in the research, it exposes the variation in the same foods. So it already, you know, is, there's data there to, to talk to people saying, well, you know, this has got loads more nutrients than that one. Why? Um, so it's developing the scanner, which will empower growers and citizens uh, in learning how to grow food for nutrition. And uh, I think I probably ought to... So oh, I, I stuck that up. Um, Well, I'm going to wait to hear if, if over time or, or after this, if there's anything that's you know, already emerging that you might think are possible ways to collaborate. Um, that was a few things I was, I was thinking of. I know you've got a massive, great big garden next door. I don't know how used it is at the moment, but um, you know, projects could happen there potentially. Um, the other thing I need to think about is that if we start testing food and we find out that it's poor, not very good, then we need to teach people how to improve it and we need to draft in the skills to do that and so we would need learning centres in order to um, teach people how to do it and with a scanner or a way of measuring success people can understand what it is, start to understand what it is to grow, grow food for nutrition. So um, that brings me to the end, I think I've gone over a little bit so <laughs> thank you, thank you for listening. And uh, any questions?